Episode three of Eyes of Liberty features Andy Estrom, CFA, CFP, author, but most importantly, a Bitcoiner. And he wrote a book that we're going to get into a bit called Why Buy Bitcoin? Now, you got to wait for the end when we go over the 14 characteristics of money and how Bitcoin grades in each. Teaser, it's not a perfect score. Stay tuned. You find those who have not had freedom uh, and not in a position to define freedom. They're beginning to define it for themselves now. And as they get in a position intellectually to define freedom for themselves, they see that they don't have it. And it makes them less peaceful. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice. Monetary debasement is out of control. Runaway debt like an animated snowball. The only question is, do you want to take the steps to get out of the way? Or do you become a casualty to parasitic greed? Andy, how's it going? Thanks for joining me on the show today. Ulrich, it's great to see you, man. How are you? Oh, man, I'm fine. And I want to apologize for not showing up to the meetup. A couple of weeks ago, I believe I was lifting weights. Uh, BTC Penn sent me a, me a message in the middle of my deadlifts. He's like, where are you? And I knew exactly what he meant. I'm like, oh, man, I was supposed to hang out with you guys at the uh, at Firestone Walker. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was a good time. It was Carl's meetup. I actually hadn't been in a really long time, but uh, I thought it would be a good good day to do it. And yeah, Penn's, Penn's was there. Uh, a few mm -hmm. other uh, great Bitcoiners were there, and um, it, was a, it was a small group, but it was fun, man. But, you know, you'll make the next one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, you know, I want to talk to you about a couple of things today. And, you know, normally when my guests come on, I, I want to do good research about them. And so, I'm, you know, I have your book, and I'll pop it up for the audience. Why Buy Bitcoin? It's just like one of the first books I bought as a Bitcoiner. I had Andy sign it a few years ago. And it's a and it's a good book. And I'll be honest, as good as it is, I didn't finish it. I've skipped around in different places. Uh, I didn't. I read most of the middle, most of the beginning, and and most of the end. And one day I'll go back to read it completely. But you know, you know, when you're writing and making videos, it's hard to actually read. You know, with all of us, all of us content creators. But I want to get to that soon. But looking at your Twitter recently. For your 21st episode, you plan on having Michael Saylor for your own podcast. And immediately, I, I at first I was jealous, and then I was like, I'm interviewing the guy who's interviewing Michael Saylor. And I don't think that's happened to me before yet. So uh, talk to me about how you got Michael Saylor to come on your podcast in the near future. Yeah. So um, I think the initial contact with Michael goes back to summer of 2020 and i had been doing a regular podcast it was basically a quarterly podcast for swan and it was preston pish and i would kind of do our quarterly update and i think we did an episode after the summer because the summer was when the first news had hit the tape right it was microstrategy was uh investigating something along the lines of investigating options for what to do with its treasury right it had half a billion dollars of cash on the balance sheet and there were several items that were being investigated you know other than treasuries like gold like bitcoin made the made the press releases as, as i recall and then of course the next step was he started uh he started buying bitcoin with the balance sheet or it may have been that first he, I think he did that, and then he may have announced the tender offer, um, basically to buy out shareholders that weren't interested in coming along for this Bitcoin strategy, this new Bitcoin strategy. Uh, spoiler, spoiler alert, by the way, wind the clock forward to today. Uh, anyone who sold into that 
tender offer, sold MicroStrategy. Oh my. Stock <laughs> made, a, made a big mistake. Um, so I confess, I don't remember the exact order of operations, but I had gone on this on the Swan Signal podcast and I had observed that the balance sheet of MicroStrategy could probably support some debt and perhaps uh you know perhaps the company would consider issuing debt to buy bitcoin using leverage essentially and um of course i think it was like a a month or two later that's exactly what they did um they implemented a smarter strategy than i had conceived of or michael did which was using convertible debt rather than just outright uh high yield bonds but michael had told me when i ultimately met him that I was one of the few or maybe the only Bitcoiners who was sort of explaining at the time his strategy and how he was approaching shareholders and kind of the 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 methodical approach he was taking with respect to investigating Bitcoin as a treasury option, then buying it, then doing the tender offer to allow shareholders the option of of getting out at a premium, by the way, to where the stock had been, and then ultimately uh, issuing, uh, issuing debt. So that was the beginning of the connection. And then over the, over the years, um, you know, I kept in touch with him. Um, you know, he's been gracious with his time. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, over, over the, over the years there's, there's been contacts. And so I did approach him about coming on the show and giving him the, the, uh, the guest of honor spot with respect to episode 21. And, um, of course, uh, my <clears throat> co-host Jesse. Um, you know, I also mentioned that he was uh, that he was keen, and how Jesse and I had been, you know, talking about the water under the bridge and the journey, you know, thus far with Sailor, and how Sailor had, um, you know, used some of Jesse's, uh, I, I think, materials with respect to his valuation framework, and also my valuation framework, and so we reached out, and uh, he graciously accepted and that's uh, where we are today we still have to do the recording and i think it'll happen next week but that's kind of the long-winded version of the story that's that's awesome uh it's you know it's funny i i i, I think one day i'll probably try to approach him as like hey you know you actually started buying bitcoin probably the same week if not the same month as i did and so it's it's very i've always had that that loose um that loose relationship or relationship from afar with him it's like every time he buys for micro strategy i'm like you know that guy that guy started at the same time i did and it's amazing how far he's come and you know I, I kind of am shocked at how far i've come as like where i'm you know associated with people like i mean i used to you know watch you guys from you from afar watch Corey from afar and you know as of last week you know i was sitting up up on stage at the swan salon talking with him with uh to, with him and fred krueger and it's kind of surreal, you know. It's it's an it's amazing how big, how vast this this industry is, but also how small it is, and how with a little bit of work, with a little bit of proof of work, uh, you can send yourself into pretty some pretty awesome directions. So I'm happy for you, um, and I'm happy also to celebrate your the five year anniversary of your book. As of last week, we're recording this on the 14th. So I think about two week, a week and a half ago it was your uh, five year anniversary. And something about your book that stood out is that you called out a lot of the, just like you kind of paved the way for a lot of use cases or at least uh, perspectives of how to view Bitcoin, not just as gold 2.0 or exponential gold, but as an alternative for uh, traditional value storage, real estate, fine art. Um, my question, well, before I get into that, what caused you to write the book in the first place? Yeah, how how did it come to be? So I my journey started in 2017. I think I bought my first Bitcoin literally the day after the hard fork, the Bitcoin Cash hard fork. And it's not because I was waiting or worried about what mm -hmm. was going to happen with the fork. No, it's because I was desperately trying to fund my Coinbase account right because i was excited to to get invested i was excited to buy you know i had just done some a bunch of research fallen down the rabbit hole this was on crypto in general right mm -hmm. um and i just i wanted to i wanted to own it i had fomo um all that good stuff okay then we had the bubble of 20 
2017, late 2017. And then we had the crash. And it was, and, and by the way, price of Bitcoin went from roughly 20K to it bottomed at about 3K. Okay. So it was a long and painful journey. By the way, from peak to trough, as I recall, was something like 15 months. And so I had gone from being, for buying, being in a position of uh, large gains and profits, right? And then watching it all go into the negative. Um, and so I, in January of 2019, was asking myself, oh man, do, is, do I have this thesis correct? And by the way, along the journey, I had become much more focused on Bitcoin. I mean, it had sort of become clear that there were tons of scams. Basically, crypto was rife with scams. And so... Um, yeah, I was honestly asking myself, geez, did I have the investment thesis wrong? And that was how I started writing the book. Oh, by the way, I knew that I wanted to get my clients invested in the asset and I knew that I was going to have to explain it to them and therefore I was going to have to write it down. And if I was going to write it down anyway, I thought I might as well write it for a broader audience, you know, make it comprehensible, uh, make it, uh, into a substantial and what I felt at the time was relatively complete investment thesis. So that was the origin of the book. Partly it was testing to see how sure I was about the thesis and then also uh, realizing that uh, I might as well go to a broader audience. No, and that's and that's great because when you're trying to be a teacher, you know, the best way to be a teacher is to learn yourself. Uh, and so you're, you're going in, it's like, hey, I want to share this with other people, I better do my due diligence. And you did the most due diligence. You wrote, you, you wrote a, you know, 200 pages, 175 pages about the asset that you were so passionate about. And it's funny, you know, you were down that path in 2017. I was more in the crypto side and uh, I was very passionate. I don't know why. And I guess I'm kind of lucky. I was very passionate about Tron because I thought that that was going to be the Chinese Bitcoin. And I, I guess it hasn't died yet, uh, but you can't really sell it anywhere. So it's kind of, it's, it's, it's in a weird state of how, how valuable is it really? Um, but I do want to get back into the, like, here you are writing this book and you came up with this thesis that was very that was very antithetical or, or more expansive over the, the gold 2.0 um, viewpoint. And so what led you to make that call that, hey, everyone, you're not bullish enough. It's not just going to take over gold, but it's going to take a big slice of real estate. It's going to take a big slice of foreign assets or offshore assets. Where what Because you were kind of the first one to really push that narrative. Where did it come from? Yeah. So it's a great question, and um, I suspect that, like with many things in Bitcoin, someone probably thought of it first, and I'm failing to credit them. <laughs> but um, so, so I don't honestly know what the origin was. Um, it did. It was clear to me. It became clear to me that other assets had been monetized, so to speak, right, and were being used as stores of value. And that liquidity, as I presented it in the book, possibly could be quantified. And I think the example that I gave in the book was something along the lines of, let's say you buy a bunch of apartment buildings, right? Real estate properties. And you pay 15 times cash flow. So that's the multiple that you pay. Well, those are illiquid. You have to go you know, negotiate those deals one by one. You have to assemble this portfolio. And by the way, you know, each of those properties, you know, takes months to buy or sell. Now what happens if you take that set of properties and you float it in the form of a real estate investment trust, a REIT? Well, that might trade for 20 times cash flow. And so in some rough sense, your set of assets that when they were relatively illiquid were worth some 15x multiple. Well, they might be worth uh, 20x now that they've become liquid. And that, in some sense, was one way to measure the moneyness or the monetary premium as comparable to the liquidity of the asset. 
And so then I started thinking in terms of, well, you know, there's a lot of liquid assets like uh, publicly traded real estate, like stocks. Um, you know, I don't know if I cited bonds actually in the thesis at that time. Um, I think my thinking has evolved to assume that it'll take a, I'm talking about Bitcoin will take a substantial chunk out of the bond market, but I don't think I was thinking as much in terms of bonds back then. Um, and so that's one approach that I took. And then also somebody talked about offshore assets. Um, and I don't recall who it was at the time. That was not my original idea. It's probably somewhere in the, in the acknowledgements. Um, uh, but suffice to say that it made a lot of sense to me that if there's 20 or 30 trillion dollars worth of offshore assets, basically defined as the owner lives in a different jurisdiction from where the asset sits. Um, it, it was, it, it seemed obvious to me that Bitcoin was the Swiss bank account in your pocket. That again is someone's quote that I don't remember. It might have been actually at some point. I think Barack Obama. I think President Obama at once at, at one point said that. You know, you're. I was just as soon as you said it, I was like, you know, Barack Obama said that, but not in the not in the the warm fuzzy way. And sort of like we have to go after that sucker. So I was like, it's so funny that you mentioned that. Yeah, he was not thrilled with that analogy. And I was, I was the only. This, this is the second time I've ever heard that was when you when you just said it. It's so funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, he was right about that. Uh, probably in a in a lot of different ways. So yeah, so it just um, it also became clear to me that because remember this, I wrote this as an investment thesis, and so as an asset, Bitcoin does compete for capital with all other assets in the world. Um, it seemed too narrow to me to assume that, oh, it was just better gold. Oh, it was just going to, you know, kill fiat. We could talk about that topic as well. Um, but I just looked at my own situation, my own portfolio, and I thought, you know, if I have X dollars as my unit of account at the time to invest, um, I'm going to put some into Bitcoin because I think it's severely undervalued. And that is going to compete with the dollars that I might have put into Bond, you know, stocks or real estate or bonds or what have you. And that just seemed, um, you know, logical to me. And I think that's, <laughs> I think that's the easiest way for, I think, newbies to grasp what Bitcoin is. And sometimes it's a gift and a curse, you know, it's like they, they treat it like simply another stock, but, you know, stocks have cash flows. Bitcoin does not. Um, and, Somehow we have to, even though they start off like that, we have to still pull the newbies along to say, hey, it's it's more than that. And, and that's a great challenge. But I mean, we've gone through that challenge ourselves to try to frame what is this new, it truly is a new asset that pulls from a little bit of everything. Um, and it's exciting to every day. I mean, it's still, we're still early. We're all learning so much more and even so even so you wrote a book in 2019 and we're going to see where things have changed uh we're going to see you... where we end up i want to make one or two comments there if you'll yeah. uh oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Me. um so yeah so the it's absolutely true in in my opinion that bitcoin will take market share from a bunch of these different asset classes and yet when approaching as you said the the newbies you know the folks who are new I get lazy and I kind of hang my hat on gold. And basically I say, look, when you look at the characteristics of money, and I present 14 of them in the book, and we can talk about that if that's of interest, um, you know, basically Bitcoin already outscores gold. So talk to me, you know, come back to me. You can be a skeptic about Bitcoin. That's fine. You want to be skeptical about Bitcoin, you know, taking a big chunk out of the stock market. Okay. I get it. But but come back to me after Bitcoin has has eaten, you know, half of gold's market share, right? That'll just kind of be a good start for Bitcoin. And I think it's also, um, I think it's also the easiest sort of leg of the stool in terms of valuation and and the asset that uh, that's going to lose market share to Bitcoin. So it's the lazy man's. It's in some sense the lazy Bitcoiner's uh, response to, you know, how much how much could the valuation go up at least in the near term. 
And then these other categories of uh, market share from other asset classes. I don't want to say that's gravy, but we have plenty of time for uh, for that stuff to develop. For sure. And I mean, and just from the, from the sake of real estate, I, I like to use this example where, you know, you, you, you take this, uh, you take this oil tycoon who has, you know, who says, Hey, he wants 10 flats in London because he doesn't want to just sit on the dollars that he makes from his oil. And when you've already given the, the liquidity issue, when it comes to real estate, you know, 60 days to close 90 days, 30 days, if you're lucky. Um, and so it's like, you may want to store your value in something solid, but you may also want access to that liquidity sooner rather than later. So 30 days on, on each side, 60 days on each side, 90 days even. No one has time to wait six months to spend their money. Um, and that's where Bitcoin comes in. And it's a clear winner when it comes to real estate. Um, and that that's a good segue to my next question. You know, you being an accountant, you having actual clients, people that may not be like me or Corey Clipston or, you know, Max Kaiser. These are people who are like, hey, fiat is, you know, cash rules everything around me. You know, I just want to be able to be dollar rich. Um, but I see the value of Bitcoin for its store of value per se. Do you know of anyone that has leverage the extended use cases as you've described in your book um that aren't necessarily bitcoiners like they're saying yeah you know i thought i um, i sold my house i sold these eight houses to to buy bitcoin and i still have four houses over there i you know i got rid of this fine art do you know of it and you know of course you're not going to drop names but is that use case manifesting from your perspective perspectives as an accountant yeah, and by the way, just to be clear, I'm I'm technically a financial advisor, not technically an accountant, although I know some Apologies. accounting. Uh, but that's all right. right. Yeah, I mean, look, to be honest with you, probably the mo I mean, the thing that springs to mind for me, honestly, is customers of the handful of Bitcoin companies who are, you know, getting curious and there's and they're starting to make their purchases, right? Um, you know, you mentioned Swan as an example. Um, you know, I'm helping out on ramp as another, uh, unchained would be an example. I mean, you know, probably river. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of these Bitcoin companies where they have smart people who will take calls from wealthy, uh, you know, wealthy clients or potential clients who have cash to invest and who are interested in Bitcoin. And they're thinking to my, to themselves, well, either I got a piece of my stock portfolio um, that I might be interested in allocating, or you know maybe I just sold a property and I want to put some fraction in Bitcoin. And so I think, well, I know for a fact that those transactions, those buys uh, by people are happening. And so I wouldn't really consider most of those people to be Bitcoiners yet. Um, they're learning, right? And um, and the people that work at these companies are helping them learn. They're helping them on their Bitcoin path, on their Bitcoin journey, just like you are, um, just like I am. And so, yeah, I think those are maybe soon to be Bitcoiners or future Bitcoiners. They're kind of curious. They're allocating some of their portfolio to Bitcoin, but uh, but it may be early days for them and they're sort of just getting started. That's interesting to hear. And yet, you know, the world that I am in with Bitcoin, it's inundated with you're either in or you're out. You know, it's either no coiners or it's full maxis, you know, going to the meetups or living in my fiat life. And there are people who just have no interest in it. And it's like or maybe it's like, oh, you know, poking it to see like what what is it doing? But never, never putting legitimate skin in the game. So it's funny, you know being a financial advisor dealing with high net worth individuals you deal with people who are kind of just you know straight business you know not about the flowery you know descriptions of bitcoin is time shout out their gg you know they just want to hey this is my allocations let's get let's get to it um and I that's want the investment to, perspective ahead. right i'm sorry to interrupt right. you but no no it's fine you know bitcoin is so many different things it's not just an investment. It's not just a store of value. 
some people call it savings. You know, I have great respect for Pierre and Morgan Richard. They came on my show. I think they were episode five. And they look at it as savings. And I understand that perspective, although I also see that as future Bitcoin more so than today Bitcoin, only because of the volatility of the of the purchasing power, right? You know, like it's great. I can it's great that I used to be able to buy only one car per Bitcoin and now I can buy two cars per Bitcoin, depending on the type of car that you buy. And there was a time, you know, when a when a single Bitcoin would only buy a fraction of a car. But the path along that, of course, has been hugely volatile. And so I still view it as more of an investment than savings. But again, these definitions are blurry. You know, what is what is money or how much moneyness is associated with that real estate portfolio we we talked about? So everybody or many people want to see bright lines between, oh, no, this is a monetary asset, you know, and that's a cash flowing investment and asset and that's a store of value and that's a collectible. But the reality is there's overlapping uh, characteristics to all these assets. Each asset can have multiple uh, multiple characteristics or it's or be its own sort of unique bundle of characteristics. Um, and that's just one of the uh, factors that makes Bitcoin so fascinating and challenging to understand. It has its own bucket of those. It has its own denominations or, or allocations of those characteristics. And we're all discovering that as its price is being discovered over time as well. Um, a lot of ways that people try to predict or um, figure make sense out of what's happening with the price is they develop models. Um, I want to talk to you about two. One that kind of um, materialized probably at the probably around the same time, probably around the time that you discovered Bitcoin, maybe a little bit after, um, which was the Plan B stock to flow model. And then I want to talk about this power law that's reared its head. Some people say ugly, some people say beautiful um, last year. Um, my question to you, you know, and I was around when Plan B was talking about the stock to flow, and I was somewhat excited about it as well. Um, from your perspective, and I know that Corey was very much against it, but from your independent perspective, um, would you would you say that it the the stock to flow and its many evolutions, because it's changed over time as it's been broken, yep. is a good or bad? Yeah, I mean, that's interesting, good or good or bad. I think that stock to flow as a concept is very useful. Um, and it's something that I cite in my book and why buy Bitcoin. Um, I think it's, you know, one of the primary reasons that gold has maintained uh, its monetary use case and its store of value use case. So as a concept, I think it's really important. Um, I think to Corey's credit, he and others debunked it as a statistical model. The thing about the stock to flow models, like it's honestly, uh, or it's been a while since I've looked at that stuff, but I'll just, I'll work from memory as best I can. My recollection is, is there were claims based in regression statistics that were made about those models um, that did not, comply with the assumptions required by practice of such statistics. So from a statistical math ma mathematical perspective, um, I think they were uh, invalid, let's just say. And then I think with respect to predictions that were made, which I think included a timeline, not just you know price targets, uh, didn't pan out, let's say. So in those respects, uh, the models were, I believe, statistically incorrect and also maybe not useful because if the claim was, oh, you know, this is how price is likely to evolve over time, over a particular number of years, then, um, you know, then then that was a failure. Um, I think with respect to um, the power law model that you mentioned, I got to be honest with you, I haven't dug into it in detail. 
one concern I have with models in general is that many of them uh, are basically built on back testing and they do make predictions generally about the future, um, but it's hard to know in advance whether those predictions are going to pan out. So for example, in general, as an investor, when I think about whether an investment or an asset class uh, is likely to deliver the return that I expect or that I seek, um, you know, I people build models and they back test the data and they say, oh, you know, here's a strategy for trading or here's an asset that you could have bought, you know, that would have worked and made you money historically. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the you know that the model is going to pan out on a forward-looking basis on a on a prospective basis. So any model that someone proposes, I will, you know, even if it fits the data historically, I will be more compelled if it has a fundamental underlying reason why it's going to be correct. Number one, and then number two, that it gets specified and defined, and then some time goes by and the numbers pan out as were projected. So so yeah, so I don't know how long power law has been around, you know, if it proves to be if after it was specified and stated publicly, you know, some years later it proves to have been useful, um then I'll probably put more stock in it. And I'll I'll add I'll just add one, you know, one final tidbit here which is I did put a a projection, you know, price target for Bitcoin. I was actually going to go to that yep. <laughs> in in my book in Why Buy Bitcoin, and just to talk about the broad strokes. So it was five years ago that I put this price target out, and the price of Bitcoin was roughly eight k, you know, eight and a half k, I think, and it was a ten year price target, and the ten year price target was four hundred k, four hundred grand. So let's use the rough numbers and say 8K to 400K, you know, a multiple of 50 times, right? 50X, your investment is what I suggested or proposed in the book over a decade. Now, we're halfway there, uh, time-wise. Uh, it's been five years. There's five years remaining. I think it's interesting to observe that we're also about halfway there rate of return-wise. Because if you say, if you assume that it's an exponential, um, you know, path from where you started to where you might end up, um, and you expect to make 50x, well, if half of that comes in the first five years and half in the next five years, you take the square root of 50, right? That's about the square root of 49. It's about 7x. So the implication could be that you expect to make roughly 7x in five years, and then the next 7x in the next five years. And perhaps coincidentally, I don't know, but that's about where we are because price went from eight and a half K to, you know, just under 60 K I think right now. So we're kind of more or less on track. Now, a lot of caveats there. First of all, you know, this is, this was the reasonable valuation that I put forth on a 10 year basis. Doesn't mean it's right. Um, although I do think it's based in logic. Um, secondly, the volatility obviously along the way has been massive. So it's not like you can draw a straight line between the starting point and the potential ending point. But, um, you know, so far, uh, so far, so good. And there's a couple of messages in there. One message is with respect to the investment potential. And again, leaving aside all the other great reasons to own Bitcoin, but looking at it just as an investment. You know, it's been great to make 7x here over five years. And uh, another 7x, if it happens over the next five years, uh, probably is is not a bad outcome, especially considering that as an investment, it's been de-risked quite a bit thanks to uh, the launch of the ETFs, thanks to all the great features and functionality people are building with respect to layer twos on top of Bitcoin, um, thanks to education, the efforts of you and many others, um, you know, helping people understand what this thing is. Um, yeah, I think the some of the risks that I wrote about in the what I call the 40 pages of FUD 
uh, some of those risks are much reduced today from where they were five years ago. Yeah, you know, I think that it's a it's a very brilliant, um, fortunate, fortunately brilliant as well, because you know a lot of different paths could have could have uh, happened from us to go from eight k to fifty six sixty k now to potentially one day four hundred k, and even if that number goes up, you know, it's funny because wherever you started, um, that 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 eight and a half, whenever it was. It wouldn't be surprising if six months later, you know, it would have been as much as 12K or it would have been as low as 5K. You know, the volatility uh, during this time of price discovery is uh, is incalculable sometimes. And when you think about when you think about that next year, you know, some people's very bullish predictions are exactly 400K, you know, and then. But guess what? The next year after that, if you believe in cycle theory at all maybe right back down to the gravity well we know as 58k so it's it's very interesting the um you know how no matter but no matter what we're generally up and to the right and you talk about exponentiality and i like to consider that that exponential growth you know most people are generally okay when they're investing in home depot or uh, or bank of america and they they appreciate that linear growth um, but when you consider the adoption rate of Bitcoin and that more people are coming into it every day because of its its general use case, and then when you consider the hard cap of twenty one million, that there is no there is no you know funding uh, by by ex, uh, expanding the shares of a company, there is no money printer that you have the, this this downward force of scarcity and this this upward force of of adoption and now you have like now you have exponential you have a you have a potential x squared of whatever you're going towards and that's why and i kind of try to show that that like that as an analogy for that's why you see such powerful moves uh in either direction um because bitcoin's trying to figure out what is my actual fiat value and then when you consider money printing as well um you just have the formula for a potential um, wave of dollar valuation that people just aren't ready for. Um, it's a great point you make about the about the numerator and the denominator having drivers that are both powerful. And yeah, you. It, I think it's a really. I think it's an excellent point. I think it's really well taken. And by the way, it's we like to talk about price targets and and models and all that stuff. And it's just a good reminder to people who are listening and learning about Bitcoin that we don't know the path. It can be extremely volatile. You know, it's really important to to take a long term view and not a short term view uh, on the value of this thing. If you're thinking about it as savings or an investment or a store of value, which I think most people, at least in terms of the potential uh, capital that they're committing to Bitcoin, are thinking in terms of. I mean, obviously, there are people in the world who are using it to transact because they don't have an alternative. Those are, you know, that's a very important use case as well. Um, you know, Alex Gladstein, HRF, those guys are real focused on that use case, and I think it's really important. Um, but yeah, with respect to the rest of us who are fortunate enough to have capital to commit and also live in... Um, live in places and jurisdictions where our rights to transact are mostly respected. Um, these are some of the important drivers of uh, Bitcoin's price in the in the short term, uh, whereas in the long term, the fundamentals should win out. And I think the fundamental the fundamentals of what makes Bitcoin successful is that we we have established a security, its ability, its the the statement that says it shall not be taken from you in any weird rug pull way and that's because of its cryptography and i think on top of that we develop you know potential for medium of exchange uh, and I, or uh, the ability to transact quickly um quickly and accurately quickly and in and in, in inexpensive i think that's why the layer 2 lightning network has established was established when it was established after we first first settled its security layer. 
Um, and so I kind of want to talk to you. I think that's a good segue in talking about the characteristics of good money with the time we have left. There are 14 of them, and I don't want to sell any of them short. Generally, um, generally, people like to describe the characteristics of money in six ways, maybe eight ways. Um, and you have captured those on top of a few more. And I forget which ones they actually are. I wasn't ready to take my own test. I'm testing you today. So um, I want to go down one by one. Uh, and this is chapter. I don't know what chapter this is. This is on page, at least for the book. This is on page 112 in your book. It's called Bitcoin. Oh, it's chapter six. Bitcoin and the 14 characteristics of good money. And this is how you saw it in 2019. And generally, I want to talk to you about, hey, is the rating still good? Is it worse? Is it better? Uh, we'll just go one by one. First, you talk about identifiable and you call it five out of five. Um, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but um, distributed system of computers keep the Bitcoin ledger and since access to Bitcoin addresses use proven cryptographic tools, um, will fail to distinguish a fake Bitcoin. Miners will fail to distinguish a fake Bitcoin from a real one. Uh, talk to me about your perspective of identifiable. Is it still five five out of five? This is one of those that I don't think is a, a universal characteristic of money. You added that one. Well, okay. I'll push back on that. Some okay. people might not use the term identifiable, um, but basically it comes down to, can you be sure that this is the money you think it is, right? A corollary is, is it hard to counterfeit? Um, and so... Yeah, the basic premise is people look at the dollar, and it is possible to counterfeit cash dollars. Um, it's even possible to counterfeit electronic dollars. We saw that happen with a foreign central bank. I want to say it was like Bangladesh. You know, somebody basically scammed uh, this foreign central bank out of, I think it was tens of millions of dollars. It might have been a hundred million dollars. It was a big number. But yeah, others may use a different term, but I think identifiable and resistance and being resistance to counter uh, resistant to counterfeiting is extremely important. And one of the beauties of Bitcoin is that it's this network of nodes. They all are operating software that is compliant with the system. And anyone who tries to, uh, you know, who tries to engage with the system in a way that does, uh, does not comport with the rules is out of consensus gets rejected and it's very clear and so if a user understands how bitcoin works um then they're going to reject anyone who attempts to spend unspent transaction outputs that they don't possess number one and number two they're also yeah they're gonna they're gonna reject basically any attempted transaction um, that doesn't comply with the rules, including and especially, uh, you know, the limited supply and uh, and attempts at, at double spending. Double so spending, I think yep. Bitcoin mm -hmm. is still five out of five. I will admit the one thing that that maybe it's not five out of five on a, in identifiability is uh, with respect to people confusing it with other assets, right? So Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, right? That's exactly um, right. But again, if you're transacting that network, you know, the address that you're using will, I think will, will, it's, they're still, they're, they're using different addresses. I don't think Satoshi's vision uses the same ones as, uh, as our, uh, as the base, as the base, uh, Bitcoin. Is that correct? Yeah. I'm actually out of date on the address format. I do remember the time when Bitcoin cash forked off a of Bitcoin. And so you had uh, the same address format, but I don't mm -hmm. know if they fixed that, quote unquote, fixed oh. that or changed it on purpose or accidentally. I'm out of date. Interesting. Yeah. And, and you're right. I think I normally call, I think under the pressure of running a podcast, I think I normally call it a, not a forgeability or yeah, something like that. So identifiable. I'm not used to using that term, but as you described, of course, that that's that's absolutely necessary. Next one, you gave it a three out of five and transferable. So I imagine that that's kind of the medium to medium of exchange use case or its ability to 
exchange with other people. You gave it a three out of five. What do you see it as now? That's an interesting question. I think you have to say it's improved because if transferability is all about the ability to get the money from me to you for any reason, you know, whether it's as a meeting medium of exchange for a good or service or otherwise, then you have to say, well, five years later, are there more wallets? You know, are there more ways of transacting and transferring Bitcoins or are there fewer? And I have to say there are more. I mean, first of all, if you're interacting with the network at the base layer, then the question is, are there more people with internet access? Or do I have more and better internet access than I did five years ago? And all right, always the answer to that is yes. I mean, that's been the history of communications technology and the internet specifically. So it's only getting better. The uh, the internet accessibility is getting better. Therefore, the network is more accessible. Also, by the way, I think the node count has continued to go up. So if I'm running a node, um, you know, chances are higher, not lower, that I can find other peers to communicate with. And then if you're talking about not base, lay, uh, base layer uh, Bitcoin, and you're talking about any second level or third level, you know, whether it's Lightning or whether it's just an exchange account, um, you know, a phone app, what have you, those have become more and more prevalent, not less. There's more and more of them. People have downloaded those apps more and more. They've gotten better. There are more and better companies um, and providers of these things. So yeah, in all ways, I would say it's gotten more transferable. I guess if I were to think about how is it less transferable, I mean, fees right, to, to send base layer Bitcoin do matter. And when those fees are high, you could argue they're, the, the Bitcoin is less transferable. But the fact is that the fees are pretty low today. They have spiked um, now and then over the years, but it's still very economic to transfer a whole lot of value. You can transfer billions of dollars uh, in value in, in base layer Bitcoin for very little money, very low transaction fees. I think that's important to, to present is that it's actually getting easier to use Bitcoin. And just from a technological advancement, like people understand the internet more and more. There are people, they can compare it to things like Venmo even more so than they could back then when fewer people use Venmo or PayPal. Venmo and PayPal have incorporated Bitcoin and other cryptos into their platform. Uh, and you can actually move the, move that those assets to self-custody as opposed to it being a walled garden. Uh, so definitely transferable is increasing. I would say a four, if not a 4.5. Okay, and so now we have durability. And I imagine it's like, you know, internet goes down. Uh, how do we, and you said it was a four out of five. How is, how is durability now? Five years later yeah i think the internet is more robust and more widespread so that's more durable i think there are probably more nodes bitcoin nodes being run uh we know that the hash power has gone up so there's more mining activity moreover i think that mining activity has become more dispersed and decentralized so i have to say overall uh the fact that both the internet infrastructure and the Bitcoin network infrastructure itself, um, you know, has become uh, more widespread and more powerful. I'd, I'd say we're we're at least as durable as we used to be, probably more so. That's right. No, I, I tend to agree with that. The next three: divisibility, dense and density, and scarcity. You labeled all five out of five. Any any feedback on to? onto those three, like I don't imagine they are gonna go down, but maybe you can give a summary of those three and how and why you considered them five out of five then. Yeah, so divisibility five out of five, the fact that each Bitcoin of which there are 21 million is further divisible into a hundred million pieces means that, yeah, you can, at current values of Bitcoin, you could transmit very, very tiny amounts of of, uh, of value. So clearly, clearly it's highly divisible. 
Um, the density in terms of the value density, right? This gets to, you know, how much value can you throw in your backpack? You know, with hundred dollar bills, it's quite a bit of value. With gold, it's also quite a bit of value. But Bitcoin is is even much higher because obviously one seed phrase uh, or one password gives you access to all the money you've got on that, uh, you know, set of unspent transaction outputs that's associated with it. And that could be enormous, can be billions of dollars. So um, that was already the case that it was uh, potentially a very dense uh, way to store and transmit uh, value. And that's absolutely true today. And then the scarcity aspect, obviously hard cap, right? World's first truly scarce uh, limited supply asset. By the way, you asked, you know, how could this change or maybe even go in reverse? I mean, if someday this is a risk of Bitcoin, there's not enough transaction fees, right, to keep the network secure. In theory, you know, we could get a tail tail emission, right? Someday. I think it's not impossible. I think it's low probability that we ultimately get uh, increase in supply and inflation and, and change in that hard cap. Uh, but it's technically not impossible. And another thing in terms of divisibility, it's also not impossible. And if Bitcoin becomes a unit of account for the world, it may be necessary for us to go beyond the divisibility of our current Satoshi unit. And instead of one 100 millionth, go maybe add another 10 to uh, uh, divide that by 10 even or divide it by 100 even so. Um, yeah. That's not outlawed in the code. Um, and so you have fungibility. And this is always one I remember I had a, a co-worker, a very smart lieutenant colonel, used to mine Ethereum. And he said that fungibility was a big issue for him. And you labeled it. And of course, he stopped being involved in crypto and Bitcoin uh, probably in 2018, 2019. So you say it was a three out of five then, and you th then you say four out of five in the future. What are your thoughts on its fungibility now? Yeah, this is a really, this is actually a hard one. I mean, I think it's complex and I think it's subtle. I think that as a practical matter, you have early coins that are not associated with people's identities. There are some of those, right? Some of those early mined coins. Then you have coins that were mined later, you know, with the eye of Sauron, uh, you know, the various <laughs> governments of the world, you know, trying to figure out who owns what coins. Um, still, you know, there are some coins being mined anonymously, but it's gotten a lot harder. And anybody who's bought Bitcoin in exchange for dollars, for the most part, you know, it's KYC rules, know your customer, so they have your identity. So to the extent that identity is so associated with any particular uh Bitcoin unit or unspent transaction output, um, there's a potential for for lack of fungibility uh, there. Now, today, as a practical matter, I would say that most Bitcoins are fungible in the sense that most people who own Bitcoin uh, can swap their coins for other coins, or you know, my coins are no better or worse than your coins for the most part. Although the exception is, you know, you have OFAC. Um, Office of Foreign Asset Control. I, I'm trying to remember if it's the OFAC list or or one of the other, uh, you know, government U.S. government lists that basically they try to keep track of coins that are owned or believed to be owned by or controlled by, you know, enemies of the government, terrorists in particular. And so, um, so there are some coins that would be hard to spend or that the U.S. government would make it very hard to spend or swap for other coins. And then you've got potential fungibility via coin joins um, and mixing services. Those have come under attack uh, very recently. And so I think it's really complicated to ask the question, you know, is it more or less fungible today than it was five years ago? Uh, my sense is it could be more fungible in that more people own it and therefore there's just more players in the system but it could be less fungible with respect to uh, implementation of sanctions and limitations on, on mixing services. That Those would be my thoughts at the moment on fungibility. Yeah. And of course, you know, with all, with all technology, the tech, the counter technologies are catching up. So I imagine that the governments are becoming smarter in how to 
track uh track the network with the chain analysis and stuff like that um, i do I, by the way i want to add one thing too because i want to mention you know chowmey and mints you know uh, uh projects like fetty um which i think are are tremendous um obi's been working on fetty for years now um you know there's a bunch of very uh you know just moon and and uh uh you know jeff booth just great players involved and i want to recognize that project the nice thing about mints such as that which by the way are a second layer above the base chain so you know it's not the same as talking about base layer bitcoin but there are projects such as that one that are working to uh enhance fungibility uh with respect to bitcoin at least um on the second layer and hopefully we get some sort of custodial services at the, uh, or I'm sorry, not custodial, but self-custodial services at the second layer in the in the near future. Is that is that more custodial? That that fediment, uh, that mint um, technology you were discussing with with Booth. Well, yeah. So it's, and I'm not an expert on it, um, mm -hmm. but my understanding is that it can be placed in the hands of a set of chosen key holders so in other words mm -hmm. yes it's custodial in the little, sense little that, trust yeah there's a quorum there you know that has control but that quorum can be customized and designed such that yeah the trust level is let's say optimized uh by the users programmability of the money is great especially when it's open source i'll say that um Short-term stable value, and that was a one back in 2019. And you said probably three out of five in the future. Now, I'm not going to skew your, your results, but I do notice that you know the, the volatility has slightly reduced in, in epics, but not by much. So I'm going to say a one and a half or two. What do you say um, about short-term stable value? Yeah, I think you're right. Um, Five years ago, it was very, very volatile. Although every four-year halving cycle that goes by, the volatility seems to decrease. And so, yeah, I think we're, I think it's slightly less volatile. And by the way, when I'm talking about volatility, I mean with respect to purchasing power of goods and services. Right. People use dollars as a proxy for that, or or their local fiat currency. Um, I think in terms of yeah, purchasing power of the stuff that we need to live. But yeah, it's still very volatile, albeit slightly less so than in you know years past. It's important to frame it that way. The purchasing power of Bitcoin is not my, it's not the do the dollars. If we can avoid the unit of account and say what what what's what's the dollar worth? A dollar is volatile in and of itself. How many apples can you buy with a dollar now versus five years ago? Is obviously less. And five years from now, I am almost certain it will be even fewer. Um, it's something to remember that the purchasing power of whatever unit you're using, the long-term stable value, you said a three out of five today and probably a five out of five in the future. Um, long-term stable value, short-term stable value. So, talk to me about how you separate those because you say short-term stable value in the future. Do you, I guess you mean, the value of it going back to that first one you was talking about the value of it one week versus the next but i guess the long-term stable value is probably the value of it one year versus the next is that what you're yeah, kind of that's okay, right gotcha, that's, go ahead. that's in the same vein although i'd probably pick longer than a year you know i'd probably pick Four a year maybe multi-year periods yeah mm -hmm. exactly um it's uh yeah it's it's very it has the potential to have very long-term stable value if it reaches if it eats a bunch of the market share of gold, for example, and if it becomes uh, more like gold in terms of um, how users it's recognize yep. its monetary properties, then yeah, you look at something like gold and you say, oh, it has maintained, you know, the classic example of whatever it costs about an ounce of gold to buy a good men's suit. Um, and that's been true that's right. for, a, for a very, very long time. One way, by the way, to look at it different is, uh, well, actually, it could, as Michael Saylor says, go up forever, Laura, in terms of its purchasing price uh, or its purchasing power. And that is entirely possible. And that's a hopeful vision for Bitcoin 
reaching its full potential um, over the very long term, but that's probably over uh, multiple decades. Yeah, I would say so. And of course, as tech, you know, Jeff Booth, as technology enhances, so does our ability to to acquire our goods and services quicker. Um, and Bitcoin, because it's deflationary, because it allows technology to do its thing for us, as opposed to the fiat printer uh, pushing us further away from our goods and services. Unseizable um, is four out of five, and so is censorship resistant. They're kind of related. Um, want you to talk about those kind of kind of t together, if you could. Yeah. So censorship resistance is about can someone stop me from paying you with Bitcoin? And then unseizability is, yeah, can someone take it from me per, uh, forcibly or from you forcibly? And I think they are, these are some of the best characteristics of Bitcoin, although they are imperfect in the sense that if someone really attacks somebody, they may be able to get their Bitcoin. It's not 100% unseizable in most cases, although we could talk about the details there. And then censorship resistance uh you know likewise i think there are miners uh that will refuse to uh process transactions you know to to ofac non-compliant addresses as an example but on the other hand there are other miners who probably will process them so and that's evolving over time so yeah i think bitcoin is highly unseizable and highly censorship resistant but I don't think it's perfectly unseizable or perfectly censorship resistant. One thing I'll say about unseizability is technically speaking, uh, one cannot be compelled to cough up their Bitcoin, although one must be prepared to undergo, you know, torture or death. I actually, uh, I'm, I, I think I put this in my next upcoming video of Pleb Underground. If you're willing to die on this hill, um, then you can actually take your Bitcoin with you. And, you know, people who want to extort you or, uh, or threaten you, they may have to figure out another way to work, to pull that Bitcoin out of your head. Um, and it's a, it's a very interesting dynamic. Sailor highlighted that in his Breed Love series. And it was a, it's a very interesting use case when it comes to criminality. It is. Um, and of course, you know, there are lots of ways to custody Bitcoin and, and uh, you know, multi-institution custody like OnRamp is doing is one is one example that sort of has pros and cons associated with it uh, with respect to being compelled to to cough up uh, to cough up Bitcoin. The next one is private. Um, you gave it a two out of five and three out of five in the future, and I find that it's somewhat related to fungibility as well because you want those coins to kind of look like the other coins to increase your um your privacy in the world and of course the privacy privacy also carries its own its own characteristics when it comes to non-kyc um what are your thoughts on you said three out of five in the future the future is now are we more private are we less private yeah so this is a really good point i like your comment about fungibility and privacy are are very interrelated and i think that's true but also, I think that the characteristic of privacy is a different characteristic than fungibility, at least res with respect to how we use a form of money, whether it's Bitcoin or anything else. The privacy one is something that I am optimistic about, although I don't. I have mixed uh, I have mixed feelings and thoughts about where we are today versus five years ago and where we're going in the future. Um, I think that one of the reasons Bitcoin has, for the most part, stayed legal and been non-prohibited in most jurisdictions is the fact that it's unfortunately not all that private today because of the uh, know your customer uh, rules uh, that we talked about before. And so I'm hopeful that users of Bitcoin have more privacy in future. My sense is there probably is greater privacy on Lightning uh, and other second layers potentially, but I think there's still a lot of work to do in that regard. And, you know, a lot of smart developers and great business people are trying to figure out ways of maintaining privacy, but it's going to be 
unfortunately, I think constantly under attack by governments, uh, at least for the for the foreseeable future. So we'll just have to see how it, how it develops. I see privacy as a double edged sword or a, or a gift and a curse because as not private as it is, remember Bitcoin has no rulers. So therefore any participants have to abide by the same rules. So as as lacking in privacy as the regular individual users, the retail users are, governments that participate on the blockchain or on the time chain will also be exposed to the same auditability. And we see that where we could track to the Satoshi when Germany was selling their Bitcoin. We know when the United States government, the, the hundreds of thousands of coins that they've confiscated, when they drop them on Coinbase. And that's a beautiful thing when you consider that, hey, we cannot audit how much they spend on their defense budget. Um, and so this is kind of the checks and balances of Bitcoin. What was there in the first place? You know, the Satoshi made this so that no, no big entity could skirt the system and skew the rules. Um, and so while we have to work on privacy at the higher layers, um, I think we got the the auditability right on the base layer. Um, so the last two are very interesting. You said required for some um, subjective, I added, important purpose, mm -hmm. and then backed by a powerful agent. Um, and they're probably big enough to talk about one by one, but it's, it's interesting that um, those points, those are the points that don't normally come with the characteristics of money, but you added those. And I think it's so important that you do. And that important purpose we'll talk about first, one out of five today, and then two, only two out of five in the future. And I kind of like that. Maybe you can expand on that. Yeah. So these two characteristics sprung out of conversations I had with, let's say, normie financial type people when I was first investigating Bitcoin. And they said two things. They said, you can't pay your taxes with it. Talking about Bitcoin <laughs> at that time, at right? That's that required for some important pur purpose. And you know, don't even think about challenging the dollar because the dollar is backed by the U.S. military, and that's your powerful agent. So, when people think about the dollar specifically as a form of money, they're talking about oh, you know, these these two characteristics in a lot of cases. And I think that you know, I have to acknowledge like if you can pay your taxes with it and if the jurisdiction in which you reside requires some form of money, probably their local fiat currency um, to pay, like, is that going to increase demand or not increase demand for that form of money or make it, you know, more or less useful? Well, it's probably more useful. Um, and then likewise, yeah. Uh, is it, is it more likely to be good money that's widely adopted uh, if it's backed by the U S Navy? Probably, maybe that helps explain why. Partly explain why the today dollar is still the world's reserve currency. So that's those two, and I think yeah, these are frankly by these definitions, Bitcoin scores poorly. Probably will score poorly for the foreseeable future, except for I can certainly imagine a world. We already had this uh, to some degree. There are some merchants, people who sell things useful goods and services that only accept Bitcoin. So already it's required by some, uh, you know, by some vendors. And then, you know, in the future, maybe already, we'll likely have some powerful agents that are standing behind Bitcoin, in part because of the work of, um, you know, smart strategists. Um, Matt Pines comes to mind, you know, guys who understand national security, um, Ovik Roy as well. Um, you know, all the Bitcoin Policy Institute folks that are helping educate the U.S. government and foreign governments, uh, presumably, on the benefits of having a Bitcoin reserve or the benefits of making sure that the U.S. government and other Western governments can, uh, you know, can safely and securely transact in Bitcoin as and when needed and while also potentially maintaining um, yeah, maintaining a supply or an allocation to the asset itself, because if the game theory plays out and if Bitcoin reaches its potential, then it's probably going to be pretty important to hold some of this 
very hard uh, money just in the way that it's been important to hold gold as a government, especially in times of conflict and war, uh, which we may be facing in the not so far future. Yeah, you know, it's funny that both of those those statements, I said sub, some subjective important purpose. And, what, you know, I bring back, you know, my little understanding of Austrian economics, which I, you know, I absolutely love. And when I think about the subjective value um, or some subjective important purpose, then I think there's nothing more important to the individual than to preserve one's time because time is our most scarce asset. And if we talk about how Bitcoin preserves our time because the work that we that we apply to the world and we're compensated with some sort of currency, nothing or some sort of money, nothing holds its value better than Bitcoin because of its scarcity, as we says, as, as it, with its programmed digital scarcity. So when we think about that important purpose, I think we're already there. Bitcoin holds holds its value and it shows that it does it's defended by and now we talk, talk about backed by a powerful agent um there's nothing more powerful especially as we move in a more digital world um than sha 256 as we know it right now if it has to upgrade to 512 or something else when we get to quantum computing sha 256 when it comes down to brute force hacking 100,000 years to actually crack anything it's no point to do it you have to play alongside of it backed by a powerful agent like that those are the types of things that give bitcoin its value for now and the future um and it's important that normies learn to capture that like everything powerful isn't physical um or everything powerful isn't a gun and everything important isn't ordained or fiat driven by a government um and so we could talk i think those can go back and forth it's just it's just matters of who's the agent and for whose purpose um, yeah look it's a great point i mean if you want to yeah. say that the powerful agent is math or the physics of the universe you know, I'll take that too. And in fact, that is the you know the rules of the universe as we understand them are arguably the the most immutable. Uh, you know, you can't negotiate you can't negotiate against math is what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. And with that, I mean, as as far as a as far as a lesson and a whole summary of Bitcoin and its characteristics, I could think of no better episode than the one I've had with you today, Andy. I thank you for your time, and it's been a long time coming. Ever since that first meetup, I went to your house. I'm like, man, I get to go to Andy Estrom's house and hang out with him. And then I was like, not underwhelmed, but I was like, huh, Andy's just a normal guy with 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 some Bitcoin and a passion. And so uh, you're my friend, and I thank you for for this date and good luck with your sailor interview. Thank you, Ulrich. Pleasure's mine. Uh, it's been great getting to know you, and uh, keep up the great work bringing fantastic educational content to your audience and helping people learn about Bitcoin. This is uh, this is how Bitcoin wins in the long run. Amen to that. So that was Andy Estrom, a uh, financial advisor, a uh, longtime Bitcoiner, and he just knows his stuff. He wrote a book back in 2019. You can buy it on Amazon. Pick this up. Um, it's just, it talks about his past and how he came to Bitcoin. It talks about the questions that he was asking about the traditional financial system. Uh, he's a good guy and he's someone that you want. If you're a Bitcoiner for any length of time, you want to shake his hand. I'm Sir Ulrich, like my father before me. Tune in next time when I bring on another brilliant Bitcoin guest.